Thank you, Kari, for such a kind introduction and for bringing us together. Um, your efforts are truly legend. This is a heroic accomplishment as far as I'm concerned. You had such tremendous obstacles to overcome in getting this going, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful. Um, this, as I mentioned to folks uh, in the discussions this morning, this is um, an area, despite the fact that I have written a lot about uh, animals in literature, animals, zoo animals in literature is something that I have studiously avoided for quite some time. So um, it's with your encouragement that I'm returning to this subject and uh, in many ways a newcomer to it as well. Um, as I try to share my screen here, um, I will welcome you all to my home here in Auburn, Maine. Um, which uh, is very close to a beautiful spot between two large bodies of water, um, some of which I can see from my house, um, called Amit Gonpontuk to the land's original owners, who um, are the Abenaki peoples. And I wanted to start with an acknowledgement uh, of my gratitude to them for being such wonderful stewards of the land and for persisting and for enduring um, on this land. And also to apologize to them for my people's involvement in making their uh, troubles, making their sufferings uh, worse. Um, so land acknowledgement uh, done. Now I can talk uh, up to you guys about xeno-pregnant endings and zoo beginnings or zoo beginnings in contemporary fiction. I'm going to bookend my talk with bits of poetry, which is weird for me, but there it is. Um, and the first is actually a poem that I will read to you. Uh, it's a translation in English from uh, the original Polish of Nobel laureate Wisława Zimborska's 1956 poem, Bruegel's Two Monkeys. This is what I see in my dreams about final exams. Two monkeys, chained to the floor, sit on the windowsill, the sky behind them flutters, the sea is taking its bath. The exam is history of mankind. I stammer and hedge. One monkey stares and listens with mocking disdain. The other seems to be dreaming away. But when it's clear, I don't know what to say. He prompts me with a gentle clinking of his chain. The poem is Zimborska at her most brilliant. Much criticism has elaborated how well it works, both as a symbolic commentary on the post-war problem of the human, as well as an ekphrasis, or a poem about a painting. In this case, Peter Bruegel the Elder's 1562 painting, known as Two Monkeys or Two Chained Monkeys. But does the poem also work as a statement about the representation of animals? Ekphrastic poems are generally understood to be bringing a visual representation back to life, into action. And here I would make the case that Zimborska's disdainful and dreamy monkeys and irons are raising different but no less urgent questions when we read them as monkeys. What is revealed about humans, animals, and human-animal relationships through scenes of primate captivity? To clink those chains, as it were, my talk focuses on three turn of the 21st century literary narratives about primates that forge more elaborate links to captivity's institution, the zoo. Like zoos themselves, the histories of zoo fictions are troubled by colonialism and racism. Less well-developed in narratives of zoo life and in literary criticism focused on them are the discourses of sex and gender, which makes me all the more curious about these three recent fictions that do, namely Peter Hoag's 1996 novel, The Woman and the Ape, Cheris Thompson Cousins' short story, Confessions of a Bioterrorist, which is included in the collection Playing Dolly, published in 1999, and Lawrence Gonzalez's 2010 novel, Lucy. All feature cross-species intimacies that are to varying degrees facilitated by zoo staff working to mitigate the endangerment of other primate species, but large scale meditations on reproductive futurity, including dreamings of human extinction or supplantation through an evolutionary leap from the human to another or hybrid ape species, intrude at the end through a figure peculiar to all of these stories, cross primate xeno pregnancy, more specifically, a woman preparing to give birth to a member of another ape species, a condition that links futuristic laboratory life 
to a few high profile real life zoo creatures and to some profound anxieties about the human in the 21st century. More Susan, specifically- Susan, can I pause you for a second? Oh, sure, sure. I, I don't think we can see your PowerPoint. I, we just see a, a spinning circle. Oh dear. Can you try and uh, reshare or unshare and reshare your screen? Yes, I will. So stop share. Thank you so much. Um, Is it working? Yes. You can see it now? Yeah, but you still have to say uh, enter presentation mode, which is where it stopped working last time. From beginning. Can you see it or no? Uh, we can see it, but it's not in presentation mode. It's now at the, the very The presentation beginning. mode goes into a new screen and that's the screen you want to share it. It happens to me every time. So presentation mode technically is another screen and you're sharing the previous one, so you got to share a different screen. Um, so guide me. Directions, please. I'm not a clever... Oh, I see, see, see. Wait, wait, wait. I got the problem. I got the problem. I got the problem. Joke. All right. And... There we go. Is yeah, that okay? Correct. <laughs> Excellent. So there's the beautiful, beautiful poem, um, and there's the image, which uh, was the image that Kari had already shared with you guys um, as an advertising image for the talk. Um, and these are the texts that I'm talking about, um, published, uh, you'll see, within a 15-year window or so of each other, and relatively recently. And what I've moved on is to this horrific image, or maybe exciting image, depending on how you look at it. Um, so yeah, these three stories, um, more specifically, they concern anxieties about what Lauren Berlant characterizes as, quote, fetal motherhood, a political weaponization of the pregnant human body that in the US links anti-abortion agendas back to a similar move calculated to negate woman's power in the antebellum era through slave children made to quote, follow the condition of their mothers in the euphemism of the time, meaning to be born into slavery by virtue of being uh, having a mother who is a slave. Whereas the slave mothers were made to condemn their children to share their fate as property through the act of birthing them, Berlant traces through the turn of the, cent turn of the 21st century representations, transformations of human fetuses into the intimate opposite of the woman carrying them and links the development in turn to a more widespread incapacity to conceive a positive sense of the present or future of the adult American. And she has lots of examples, including the uh, franchise Look Who's Talking films that start with a fetus character. Um, there's a lot of weirdness happening around fetal imagery, especially in the end of the 21st, 20th century. Um, and I'm giving you here uh, a glimpse uh, of Leonard Nielsen's uh, famous series of photographies uh, of photographs of fetuses. Um, this one in 1965 featuring on the cover of Life magazine, just to jar your memories about what fetal imagery looks like in popular media. But what happens when the fetus isn't human? In this context, the xeno-pregnant endings of contemporaneous fictions, only two of which are by US authors, the other Danish, beg further questions about their added layers of intimate opposition, most obviously between the gestating mother of one species and the embryonic members of another. The uneven entanglements of exotics, erotics, and pronatalist ideologies across these tales raise still more questions when they turn to zoos, which become sites for mitigating not only fears of ending an extinction, but also evolutionary developments of species, including our own, and their technoscientific interventions that bring those about. Um, assuming that not everybody has read all three, um, here are some quick uh, summaries and with advanced apologies for spoilers. Um, Hoag's novel is the oldest, most zoo-centered, and perhaps the freakiest of the three. It focuses on Mad Madeline, a wealthy, closeted, alcoholic woman of leader who lets loose from her husband Adam's London laboratory a novel specimen named Erasmus. 
a member of an ape species newly discovered and about to be vivisected by Adam, Erasmus immediately strikes Madeline as uncanny, yet an attraction grows. Fleeing the city together, woman and ape consummate their love in an auspicious refuge. Once an aristocrat's attempted recreation of the Garden of Eden, the property has become a private wildlife reserve that serves as the largest zoological breeding and research center in Europe and primarily serving the London Zoo. When Eden becomes a zoo breeding facility, you know how it will end, right? <laughs> Maybe not. Um, Erasmus turns out to be just biding time there, el eluding biosecurity agents while awaiting a ceremonial unveiling of an expanded London zoo, along with the appointment of Adam as its new director. For meanwhile, Adam has named his discovery Homina Londonensis. He has the gall to name Erasmus' species after his zoo's city, quote, after the place where he imagines it would be on display forevermore. His highfalutin hubris crashes hard when Erasmus seizes the podium and is then joined, by, joined on stage by a dozen audience members who reveal themselves also to be the new kind of ape. While the others have been successfully passing as human, all declare themselves now to be collectively abandoning their attempt at coexistence, leaving the human world in chaos. Who knows who is actually a human anymore and who is not an ape? Secretly departing for their unnamed Eastern European homeland at the end, the apes are joined by Madeline, who has a sudden revelation that she is pregnant with Erasmus's child. In an entirely different lead up to a similar final image, Cousins's Confessions of a Bioterrorist centers on middle-class mom, Mary, who works as a cryogenic technician in the San Diego Zoo's frozen tissue bank. Eating lunch by the zoo's bonobo display one day, Mary and her friends Gabriella, the sociologist, and Eva, the fertility clinic physician, share their own virgin birth fantasies, by which they mean what they personally would do if provided with unfettered access to assisted reproductive technology. While the others spin dreams combating the social problems of racism and heterosexism, Mary projects a redistribution of resources and values across species lines by proposing to impregnate herself with a bonobo embryo. What could go wrong, right? Further conversations with them and with conservation biologists steer Mary towards making a rash decision while working alone one night in the frozen zoo. Going into labor at the end of the story, Mary reveals to her friends that she has made her fantasy real and with no plan for what is to come, Gabriella and Eva, it seems, will support her. The most recent example, Gonzalez's Lucy, introduces a next generation version of these stories of sorts through the title character who passes for human, but is revealed by a, her dead scientist father's notebooks to be the lone successful outcome of his solo experiments with hybridizing humans, well, himself and bonobos in his remote DR Congo research station. War erupts at the start of the novel and her father and her bonobo family are killed. So Lucy flees with Jenny, another scientist who haplessly assumes Lucy to be a human child in need of a guardian and settles her into her Chicago home. Lucy passes happily as a US teenager until a routine blood exam alerts the Center for Disease Control of her existence as a biosecurity threat. A brief but spectacular bid to secure Lucy's human rights through capitalizing on her surprisingly normate novelty in mainstream and social media leads instead to a congressional investigation and sweeping legislation to define and confine her as a dangerous animal. Imprisoned in the high security Almogordo primate facility, Lucy escapes the same sort of experimentation to which Erasmus was destined to be subjected, only in her case by killing a would-be murderer. The Milwaukee Zoo plays a small but essential role as a connective node in primate research information sharing from which Jenny's friend and the zoo's bonobo keeper, Donna Whitefeather, tracks Lucy's whereabouts and ultimately secures her secret relocation to her own family's tribal homeland. In the end there, Lucy is cared for by grandmother Whitefeather, who notes that her own great-grandfather was part wolf, and with whose grandson Lucy has become, you guessed it, pregnant. Adam and Eva, Mary, Madeline, and Gabriella, Lucy, and Erasmus. As the names of these characters indicate, the many references to Christian myth and science history in these fictions beg symbolic interpretations. If you know me and my work, though, you know I don't do symbolism very well. 
Um, and so I will argue instead that the greater challenge is to consider what together they say about the material pasts and futures of humans and other primates in mutating stories of zoo life. The centrality of female characters supported in making their own reproductive decisions, their saturation all along in conservation knowledges and efforts, their uses of zoos uh, for anything but putting themselves and their children on display, the multidimensional nature of their creativity in managing to do so, plus the shadowing of all these characters by biosecurity agents. All three authors pick up these threads to weave a different kind of story, both from what Berlant identifies as the narrative of human fetal motherhood, as well as what is typical of zoo fictions. Drilling deeper into these aspects in turn, I will argue that their pinning hopes on the fetal non-human, or more than human, demands reckonings of these fictions as not simply animal stories, but as complexly decolonial rewrites of human primate stories of sex and consequences. The title of Hoeg's novel makes the most overt reference to a specter of violence that haunts the Euro-Western cultural imaginary. Uh, lurid, if apocryphal, stories of indigenous women raped by male apes circulated widely in the contact period. As Londa Schiebinger notes, their illustrations make plain how ideas about sex and gender in the classifying imagination converge with race and species to create narratives that are as much about regulating women's behavior as justifying white colonialist supremacy. Um, and this image, as you see, is a uh, frontispiece to uh, Linnaeus's grand tome. Um, and the uh, caption underneath it explains that it is a, a quote, Negro woman kidnapped by an orangutan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Gotta love uh, what you find when you dig in the archives. Um, so while these associations persist most obviously through analyzing racist stereotypes, the prospect of literary apes degradation through relegation to zoos provides a surprisingly consistent manifestation as well through the modernist period. Whether providing a final solution to what to do with the woman slaughtering orangutan at the end of Edgar Allan Poe's Murders of the Rue Morgue, or the distinctly inferior alternative to stage performance for Franz Kafka's Red Peter in a report to the Academy, and Peter also keeps a female ape for his own sexual gratification, important detail, or the reason why the titular character fails to perform sexually for the science to, scientists to document in the zoo in Bridget Brophy's Hockenfeller's Ape, the zoo secures a sense of coercion, if not sexual perversion, in so many stories centered on male apes and built environments. If by the late 20th century, developments within the science of ethology or studying animals in their ordinary habitats arguably open up the potential for primatology to become what Donna Haraway famously characterizes as a genre of feminist theory, um, then the pattern set by older human ape fictions become all the more in need of relentless critique. A highly publicized revision of the colonialist ape rape narrative positions white women in control of what Haraway characterizes as the kinder, gentler, touch across difference formula. I'd wager that today it's far more recognizable than the bestial scenario because it has been so uh, relentlessly recreated, not just in the officially sponsored National Geographic publicity stills like this one of Jane Goodall um, and of the other famously female primates known as Leakey's Ladies Goodall along with Diane Fossey and Virate Galdacas, but also in so many more references to them that enlist the crop species handholds in the economic empire of capital. Um, this one uh, rather spectacularly repurposed by Donna Haraway from an oil company advertisement that initially ran in Natural History Magazine. I've just given you the cover and the close up there of it. Um, but old stories never really go away, do they? From Goodall's own story of how studying chimpanzees taught her to be a good mother, um, a key detail of which the really I can't seem to let go of is that she, uh, they had to uh, frequently lock Hugo Jr. as he was a baby and a toddler in a steel cage at the um, Gombe research station just to keep him safe from the chimpanzees wandering through. 
uh, yeah, she learned to be a better mother. <laughs> anyway, that's her story. Um, maybe more importantly, um, her celebrity transformation into shamanic earth mother, earth grandmother now, seems important to all of these aspects of her success that she would embrace and embody maternity, particularly um, when you put her in contrast to what happened to Diane Fossey, in which uh, her choices to be child free are symptomatized as perversion, um, as keys to her madness in some versions of her story. And I, I like this variation on the handhold image simply because it's not just two individuals anymore and it immerses her among um, uh, several uh, different lowland mountain gorillas there that uh, I think is an interesting variation on a the theme here. Um, still more literal connections between the details of these scientists and the primate zoo fictions beg further questions. Well, I don't know quite what to do with Galdicus's account of one of her female camp staffers being sexually assaulted by an orangutan, and I'll leave that one to you, Juno, if you're the expert here. Um, Goodall's fateful intimacy with a chimpanzee she called Great David Greybeard is now immortalized with a plaque on the giant plastic tree of life at Disney's Animal Kingdom Zoo. And again, with the touch across to friends handheld image in the foreground there. Um, so I read the Zeno pregnancy stories as not so much a departure in, as a swerve in this trajectory by further centering women who are challenging characterizations of human ape intimacies strictly in terms of sexual violence or coercion and opening out possibilities instead for consciously loving acts of transgression that in intriguing ways are steered still more directly towards sabotaging settler colonialist authority. I think it helps too that along the way, key components are highlighted within uh, the stories often at the zoo. The details of Mary's work routines and confessions of a bioterrorist make it clear that electro ejaculation, surgery and other invasive procedures are routinely involved in the extraction of reproductive tissues from animals, but not without benefits to their own and other species. Her growing friendship with Eva becomes a conduit for upcycling materials commonly needed in the cryogenic zoo and wasted in the human fertility clinic and for prompting Mary's wider considerations of uses and misuses of limited fragile resources like the cryogenic facility itself which, like its real life counterpart, strictly forbids hybrids. Yet, immediately following conversations during a site visit to a proposed African elephant reserve in Texas, Mary steals and implants a bonobo fetus in herself, a context that clarifies how she sees it, not as an act of self-aggrandizement or perversion, but rather as one extreme among many experimental interventions through which zoos have become hubs for staving off extinction for some by redirecting resources from others. To paraphrase Bertolt Brecht in Mary's defense, what is the crime of robbing a germplasm bank compared with the crime of founding one? Or uh, to quote Cousins's um, questions in the preface of her story, who and what gets, sorry typo, to reproduce where and under what conditions? Why are resources committed to enhancing some human and non-human reproductions and to restricting or obliterating others? Undercutting the old fantasies of miscegenation and colonial control, Mary's self-penetration with the bonobo embryo declares her body a reproductively autonomous zone through which she then donates her gestational capacities to pursue a dream that involves instead making amends to all kinds of others who historically have suffered for the benefit of her kind. That Cousins leaves Mary along with her readers unsure about whether or how her dream could come true seems pretty important and the novels afford still more space for negotiating the intersectional critiques at stake in these developments. As signaled by the title The Woman and the Apes more deliberately toys with ape rape narrative histories um, and I don't remember actually what I was expecting when I first read this novel decades ago, but I sympathize with my dear friend Ty, who teases me for inflicting on him the most disturbing thing he has ever read, namely the scene where the two first get it on. Hoig certainly messes with erotics of dominance by casting Erasmus the ape as the would-be initiator of sexual contact, 
who upon suddenly having stopped, leaves Madeline for a second thinking it was a misunderstanding. What she saw in his eyes was not simply lust, not merely the beast in him, not only naivete. There was something else there too, the subtle sadism of the streetwise kid. The animal had not stopped because of some mis misapprehension. It was holding her at bay. Please, she said. Yeah, I know, I'm hamming it up just so that you get what's going on here in the bigger picture. Um, it's only his prolonged reluctance at her increasingly intense encouragement to see it through that reveals this subtle sadism. The ape has been teasing her, making her beg for more, and in so doing to admit that she sees him as anything but a threat. So the old story is completely turned on its head. Um, the scene also erupts as a stark contrast amid Madeline's serial sexual manipulations of her husband, Adam, and weirdly becomes another way in which she rejects Adam together with the colonialist baggage that makes him so manipulable in the first place. Um, do you have to know that his surname is Burden? So yeah, the white man, Burden, it goes on. Sorry, I just don't do the symbolism. <laughs> okay, so this character, Adam, descended of British aristocrats who famously roamed India and Africa, quote, to shoot, collect, and exhibit, an inheritor to Mombasa Manor, a London mansion with a shed full of their disused taxidermy, Adam works feverishly as a scientist of animal behavior, quote, to study, present, and preserve by working his social connections towards reinventing the London Zoo as a premier conservation facility. Yet from the perspective of Danish expat Madeline, herself descended of industrialized livestock tycoons, the common goal across generations remains to, quote, preserve a feudalistic class supremacy. Um, that suffers from systemic deprivations of love. Her passion for Erasmus thus becomes caught up with struggles for freedom and equality on multiple fronts, leading back across generations and nations and forward into cross-species hybridization. Um, but unlike the other zoo stories, none of the principal players is non-white, nor do any of them go to or are they from any non-European land. So it seems an important detail that the author prefaces the novel with a statement that he has dedicated all proceeds to his charitable foundation for, quote, women and children of the third world. That's where I'm seeing some level of uh, responsiveness um, that uh, is atypical. And also, um, I would, I'm making the case here, fits this broader pattern of a decolonial theme emerging. Lucy's origins are arguably the most compromised of the three, and as her name signals, um, the plot hinges on even more direct ties to the problematic histories of Euro-white scientist adventurers laying claim to the cultural and natural histories of historically Black lands. Lucy's genetically altered bonobo mother is named Lita by her human scientist father, or multiple fathers, it seems, multiple ways in which he's father to this family. Um, yeah, he names her Lita and thereby suggests a queer vision of himself as a god in animal disguise raping a woman. While his notebooks reveal regret for his hubris, he holds out hope to the end that Lucy achieves his objective, preserving the peace-loving goodness of bonobos for the betterment of humankind and as a hedge against extinction. The murder of both parents by unnamed Black Congolese militiamen makes plain a more basic mistake in not taking into account the interests of local people or wildlife in his conservation plan, and again provides the premise on which Lucy arrives on the US, in the US as a refugee and bioterrorist threat. Less clearly engaged than the other two stories in terms of feminist critique, the struggle for equal rights and justice overtly becomes framed by anti-colonialist struggles at the novel's end. Lucy, writing to explain her whereabouts to Jenny at the novel's end, clarifies that their zoo friend Donna Whitefeather, quote, said that the US government might suspect where I am, but they couldn't come out onto the reservation without making a huge political mess. So long as I stay out of sight, they're going to pretend I never existed. Donna described it as a kind of truce. For readers in the know, Lucy's securing protection in a loving relationship as a new member of a family 
on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation uh, effectively outs Donna as a Lakota tribal citizen and the home of Lucy and her future child's family as a hotspot in the history of settler colonialism. Um, just as an aside, I don't know if anyone else is really annoyed at this trend in contemporary fiction uh, to solve white characters' problems by washing them up on the shores of indigenous lands. I could go on and on about that, so I won't. <laughs> but I do just want to acknowledge that this novel is in that problematic pattern. There, there's a risk here. Um, only Lucy goes against this grain by naming a historic place, more specifically, the site of the Wounded Knee Massacre, one of the last and deadliest moments in the genocide known as the American Indian Wars, and also the site of more recent radical pushback against this history. Um, I'm not assuming that folks are familiar with this history, so again, I'm just gonna give you a short summary of events. Um, in 1890, two weeks after the murder of the visionary Sitting Bull on the nearby Standing Rock Indian Reservation, the U.S. Cavalry surrounded and shot over 300 men, women, and children following dispute over the government seizure of the Black Hills um, in Lakota Territory. An appropriation that almost a century later in 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court decided was done without just compensation. Um, after all, the Lakota were in the right all along. That settlement, along with a formal congressional apology in 1990 on the centenary of the massacre, are hard to imagine apart from a more recent incident there, the 1973 Wounded Knee Occupation by local tribal and American Indian movement or AIM activists who held state and federal agents at bay for over 70 days on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Granted, this history isn't spelled out within the novel. Readers have to bring it. But the choice of location um, does create an opportunity for the enrichment of indigenous metaphysical and historical perspectives on Hugh Lucy's multiply hybrid fetus and adds more possibilities, many more possibilities for hope to her father's for its future. The plausible support from a worker at the Milwaukee Zoo, which like the San Diego Zoo focuses up uh, uh, houses one of the world's very few captive bonobo colonies, also provides multiple touch points with real world developments. For at a literal level, all these fictions follow the late 20th century realities of conservation minded experiments with impregnating mothers of common domestic species with fetuses of endangered wild ones, practices that led to rare successes in producing high tech zoo creatures. Meet Kurt. Kurt is an endangered Przewalski's horse born this past August to a domestic horse surrogate mother. Um, he's the latest success story of San Diego Zoo Global's efforts to repurpose somatic cell nuclear transfer, um, the technology announced to the world by Dolly the clone sheep, to keep the gene pools of critically endangered species, wild species viable. That Kurt is destined to go on display after he is weaned from his mother, whose legs you can sort of see in the background there, um, that he's destined to go on display extends a more precise history in which zoos become conduits for making assisted xeno pregnancy public. This little brother from another mother forges another link in a small but high profile chain begun in 1981 by the Holstein cow Flossie giving birth to endangered Gower calf Manhar. Um, he's a kind of wild ox native to India. Um, and that happened in the Bronx Zoo in 1981. And it was followed in 1984 by quarter horse mare Kelly giving birth to the zebra colt EQ in the Louisville Zoo. EQ's short official story uh, there indicates that he was shuttled between zoos during his lifetime, presumably for breeding, and that he died young. These spare details link up with what little is known of the many more experimental creatures through which assisted reproductive technologies have proliferated in the background of these stories. Swaddled in the seemingly endless appeal of zoo babies more generally, these rare successes belie a record marked by the suffering and waste of many more surrogate mothers, more commonly aborting fetuses that are grotesquely deformed. Notoriously wasteful, the soma cloning techniques that gave us not just this year's Kurt, uh, more controversially were used to make the five first ever cloned and gene edited primates born last year in a Chinese laboratory for which 325 
cloned gene edited embryos were implanted into 65 surrogate long tailed macaque monkeys. Um, still more startling to me is that the same gene editing uh, CRISPR Cas9 technique allegedly used by Hei Jiankui in creating the first ever gene modified human babies, Lulu and Nana, was also used to make these unnamed macaques. Uh, of course, all of these developments are linked to the other big story from 2019 of the uh, development and the creation and uh, termination immediately of a hybrid human monkey fetus. With the world thus growing weirder than Gonzalez, Hoig, and Cussens ever imagined, the pregnancy of their fiction's endings, their trade in the figure of the non-human fetus, makes me hesitant to get my hopes up too high. Haraway likens the figure of the fetus to the blue marble space shot of Earth as both sibling seed worlds in technoscience. She writes, the global fetus and the spherical whole Earth both exist because of and inside of technoscientific visual culture, yet both signify touch. Both provoke yearning for the physical sensuousness of a wet and blue-green earth and a soft, fleshy child. This is why these images are so ideologically powerful. Writing in the 1990s like Berlin, Haraway's focus there remains on examples in which the public fetus remains strictly biomedical or human. In 2020, so many touches across difference are making fetuses of all kinds appear to be not just material relations of the promise of life itself, but more importantly, pliable forms through which life promises radical changes to come. However much I reject the religious symbolism, during the whole time I've been writing and researching this project, I keep coming back to the last lines of W.B. Yeats's poem, The Second Coming, to wit, what rough beast its hour come at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. The second coming, right? Um, to keep up the good fight against that impulse though, <laughs> I will follow Berlant back to the recognition that the fetus has no story or only a frozen one apart from the pregnant body. Um, the focus on fetal motherhood as a compromised site of what nevertheless remains utopian fantasy Failure to deliver these figures from their compromised positions allows these stories to trouble linkages of zoo and laboratory life to the future of the human, or to return to Simborska's closing lines to prompt us to think about how we became, become, and will have become human with a soft jingling of this chain. Thank you. And did I get us out of the screen share? Oh no. Yes. Oh. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to see if I can do a virtual clap as well. Um, great. I'm sure there are a lot. Well, there were some questions in the chat uh, while uh, while you were speaking. Um, I don't know if we want to pick those up. Otherwise, I'm sure there are many uh, comments and questions from the uh, the audience. I'm going to um, try and open the floor um, for questions, comments, reactions. Uh, who wants to go first? Um, I can go first. Yeah. Yes. Since I, I think it was my question that I uh, um, had asked while you're still speaking, Susan. It's really uh, super uh, intriguing um, uh, talk there. Thank you for it. And uh, thank you for offering so much food for thought. So, um, yeah, I was really struck with the part of your paper uh, where you were discussing uh, the proceeds of a book and how um, you had pointed out not a single person of color was in the novel. And yet uh, the author promised to start a foundation that would go towards quote, like women and children of the third world, end quote. And um, to me, I, and I, if I remember correctly, you had posed this as, oh, this is an example of a, a decolonial um, 
effort. And to me, it seems less of a decolonial effort than another kind of effort, which is uh, enacting the idea of a white man's burden, which kind of plays out with the name of the character if I'm correct um, in remembering who the characters were in which novels. So, um, you know, there's so much criticism around foundations and charity as a problem that people think of it as a source of social amelioration when it really is just the benevolence of rich people you know, who uh, throw pennies and can never be an actual source of transformation. And it's especially problematic um, when we think about who runs these foundations, whose vision is enacted in foundations. You know? So if it's this guy who says, I'm gonna start my own foundation to then um, tell third world women and children how to live their lives, you know, it seems like that's not a tool of liberation. That's a tool of benevolent colonialism to me. Uh, so yeah, I was curious if you could um, talk more through this uh, conundrum. Um, so thank you. Thanks so much for that question, Juno. And it's something that's sort of been swimming around in my head. Um, in my discussion of Lydia Millet's fictions, I just want to flag that in my book, Love in the Time of Slaughters, um, she does a much better job of creating a, a very ambiguous character who some people have embraced as, oh yes, look, he's had a transformation because he's gone from being a real estate developer to starting his charitable foundation for towards um, preserving animals that are otherwise going extinct. And he is a partner is starting to get woke about the larger uh, context in which this is happening while they're on a site visit in Indonesia. Um, and I make a lot of that as Millet's uh, really actually calling our attention to this is about his dream. This isn't about any realities of, of animals or humans' lives on the ground there. Um, in this case, though, the fact that it's bracketed off, like it's, it's in the pages of the novel because it's on the copyright page, but it's not in the story, it seems like a really weird gesture in the first place. Um, and that's true also of the questions that um, uh, Cousins that I put on the screen for you guys. She's created a short story that starts with a preface. So there's some strange layerings going on in those two stories anyway, that I think I haven't really thought through very carefully. Um, but in the case of um, uh, The Woman and the Ape, because he is so clearly trying to rewrite the original colonial contact story of humans and um, uh, great apes, species, humans. I mean, you know, in the enlightenment definition of the human meaning, you're a white man <laughs> um, that Sylvia Winters so brilliantly uh, critiques. Um, the, yeah, that this is the oldest of these stories too seems pretty interesting as well that that aspect of it intensifies through the other narratives, whether or not the writers are aware of each other and, and consciously deliberately responding to each other, I really don't know. But I think it's kind of beside the point too because um, there are these larger um, material connections that they link up with too, which I was trying to work out through the zoo and laboratory examples there um, that aren't also very clearly uh, linked to um, colonial critique, a critique of colonialism, um, except when you bring them all together in this way. So I would say the short version of my answer is that no, I think you're right. There's something really wrong <laughs> with what Hoeg is doing in and of itself. But to me, it gains greater significance in this larger context. And I'm sorry, I wasn't more precise about that in my talk. So thank you for your question. Dennis has a question. Yeah, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering um, whether um, these novelists that you've pulled together um, uh, and are, are, are reading together, whether they're informed by um, sort of existing literary models of primates or, or more specifically readings of literary primates. So I was thinking specifically of uh, the scholarship around the King Kong films. Uh, which certainly in America takes on a uh, takes on a sort of racialized tone sort of quite quickly, um, so much so that by the 1960s version, which is the the one I started with, 
um, there's, a, there's even a small scene where the, the heroine has to explain and that she wasn't raped by King Kong, just to make that emphatically clear. And not because it says so in the original film, but because the scholarship that came afterwards said so. Um, so I was wondering kind of uh, where you place uh, your, your new contemporary writers. Are they, are they decolonizing a racialized literary space? Or are they are they taking um, are they taking something bigger? Uh, excellent question, Dennis. And I hadn't really thought through the King Kong thing, but that one I agree with you is um, over time uh, very much more self aware of the different versions of it, um, of the uh, just way in which it's rehearsing a very familiar colonial narrative there. I'm remembering from that version that you mentioned, um, they, there's specifically added that they're doing petrochemical uh, exploration as part of yeah. discovering, yeah. <laughs> so there are these- like, I think that's the same scene, right? They're putting everything, everything in together into the same 20 seconds. <laughs> hey guys, we gotta make this movie less racist. Quick, put something in there. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's pretty plausible, I think. Um, particularly given from that same time period, the way people responded to the Planet of the Apes, the, the first franchise. Um, there's a really wonderful book from the 1990s that makes a pretty uh, plausible case that um, people read those immediately as uh, racial allegories and that they were allegories of racial uh, struggle and liberation ultimately um, made them extremely powerful and disturbing um, for most of their audiences. And that I think has uh, a lot to do with, it's always a great question of why the same story gets told over and over again. And I guess that's my method as a literary scholar to find patterns in storytelling and also these tweaks, these divergences, these uh, updates or revisions um, and how that uh, somehow is, um, uh, yeah, where and under what conditions that, that happens. Um, and I think, yeah, in the case of these three narratives, to answer your initial question, I have no idea uh, whether and how the authors are aware of each other's work and, and consciously responding to each other. Um, I do know that um, uh, Cussens uh, actually isn't a novelist. Her story is pretty interesting. She's an academic. And um, as she mentions again in the preface to the story that these questions arose as she was doing site visits in both um, fertility clinics and in um, conservation uh, facilities. Um, and that it, between shuttling back and forth between these spaces, it, the larger questions for her became clear um, in a way that they probably wouldn't in the localized situations. So I think her um, entry point is quite different. And I think um, uh, with the other two, um, it's uh, to go back to Juno's observation, um, uh, Hoeg is probably best known for uh, his novel, Smell a Sense of Snow, which was made into a, a really lovely film, but there too, and maybe more close to home since he's a Danish writer, um, he's uh, created a character who's part uh, Inuit or, or Greenlander and um, uh, that he's uh, there too, uh, working through some kind of um, colonial extraction narrative more deliberately, and then coming out of that experience into this one might be part of the reason why he's got uh, he's got to add that preface in the beginning and he's got to go to that effort in his own mind. I know, you know, you're right for with whatever consequences, um, but at least in his, his thinking, uh, it seems logical anyway that he would want to be uh, calm more self-aware as he's moving along or he's on the journey anyway, let's say. Um, in the case of Gonzalez, he's coming to it from a very different um, direction. He's actually a biosecurity or a security um, specialist. So uh, this novel, Lucy, um, another way of reading it is as an allegory of the USA Patriot Act, um, which was this, again, sweeping bit of legislation that came in immediately post 9-11, basically to deprive uh, uh, US citizens and people seized by US uh, officials of habeas corpus. So basically undermining uh, our, uh, our constitutional rights um, 
to uh, be tried, uh, to be actually officially charged and tried uh, to be in a court of law rather than indefinitely maintained or detained rather, um, which is what happens to Lucy ultimately. So um, I, I really don't know, <laughs> again, whether uh, it's safe to assume that he is very deliberately um, uh, resisting the appropriation of indigenous history by the end of this novel. Um, but I do think it's really significant that he is calling attention to a history that um, has been very significant and is well known within various Native American communities um, and clearly informs the most recently the Standing Rock uh, uh, protests that happened on a basically neighboring reservation. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's open to critique too for uh, falling into this pattern that Richard Powers is the overstory um, repeats of just showing up on indigenous land as, and acknowledging it as such as being the solution to um, all of these other uh, problems that are plaguing primarily white characters. Thanks for uh, speculating with me. Thank you. Sune Borgfeldt, you have a, have, have a comment in the chat. Do you want to uh, air it publicly? Um, no, not not really. It, it was just a it was just a comment. Um, I just thought it, it felt relevant um, with all this talk of um, colonialism or decolonializing in, in King Kong um, that the book was actually billed as a, a a King Kong story in reverse on the on the Danish original cover. Oh, wow. um, among among other things, it also says it's a love story. Um, and I have it right here. Um, yeah, and a story of the struggle between science and the animal in our culture, um, whatever that means. Um, so no, I mean, it was, it was just a, a sort of um, nugget of, of information, um, yeah. Thank you. That's really important and something that as an ignorant person who doesn't know Danish wouldn't know otherwise. So thank you so much for sharing. That's cool. Any other questions? We have uh, plenty of uh, time to go. I feel like you've given us lots to uh, lots to think about. And as uh, Sarah put it in the in the chat, it's percolating. Uh, but I think Paul, you, was that a... Yeah, yeah, I, th thank you for your talk, it was really interesting. Um, but I, I was sort of thinking also because like um, sort of the, the primate species that kept coming up was the bonobo and sort of, I, weirdly enough, I have a, a feeling that it's, I've been seeing the bonobo use in, in, in novels more often the, 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 the past few, few years, I think. Uh, also, Theory of Bastards by Susan, or, well, at least also by a different author. I, I can't remember that. But there is also, Bonobo does also play a, an important role. And I was also sort of sort of wondering, because they are often seen as, as high, or sort of, well, if they're used to sort of reflect upon the human, they're sort of used to to highlight our more empathic and, and lovable features as opposed to the chimpanzees more aggressive and, and, and uh, controlling aspects um, but I was wondering whether you could comment on sort of also how how for example how in, how in, in Lucy she is sort of half bonobo half human how how that plays a role or how it, I don't know if it, yeah if you could say something about that I was wondering about that yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's an excellent question. And in Lucy's case, um, we're meant to, uh, I think, really embrace and love this character. She's presented as, uh, as um, the fulfillment of her father's dream of being the, the future or better evolution of a human. I know evolution and teleology don't really mix very well. 
but nonetheless, um, that's his plan. And she gives example after example. She can recite Shakespeare. She can sing opera. She can be a better human. She's better at humaning than humans are. Um, but as far as also a uh, plot device goes for this, um, clearly they are the closest to our species, living species, um, genetically. So there's that dimension to it, just plausibility. Um, and also to um, uh, they are the peacenik versus the chimpanzees who go to war according to the Gombe research um, is one dimension of it, but another is that they're the sexy beasts too, right? They're, the way they are peaceful among themselves is that they uh, resolve all conflict by um, sexual gestures, sexual play, and that works also at another level. With these stories, I think, again, playing on the older colonial um, narrative and trying to rewrite it in a way that um, asks humans to recognize uh, the, the um, uh, hubris of assuming that we're better than everything else, the first gesture there. But also, too, to thinking about what sex does besides reproduce. Uh, uh, children to, to produce children um, and how much uh, that labor is now sort of offshored through these different technologies. Lucy is asking us to think that way, I think more than um, the woman in the ape, obviously, um, and is working along the same lines uh, as Cousins is to open questions about that. Um, so yeah, I think it's in part to make Lucy's character more lovable. She's one of those ones when you teach the novel, um, the students invariably ask me, she's gonna make it through to the end, right? She's not gonna die. And because I have this thing, I don't know if it's a gene or what, but I forget the endings of things all the time. So I'm with them like, yeah, I don't want her to die either. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? <laughs> we'll find out. Um, so yes, needless to say, they're happily relieved uh, that she's okay in the end. Um, and I think that's part of it. Um, another thought that I'm having in the back of my head though, and this is something that I haven't been able to figure out why it's included, except maybe because um, the feminist theoretical dimensions of um, the woman and the ape and of uh, Lucy are, are in want of development, let's just say, um, that both novels include um, the main female characters involved in uh, sexual relationships with, uh, in their girlhood with other girls. So there's a kind of uh, voyeuristic plausibility to it too that Lucy um, would be attracted to everybody um, and that allows for this kind of um, scene to enter in. But uh, again, in reading um, uh, uh, just comments in Goodreads, you know, I was looking for how people responded to this novel because it hasn't been written about very much. I found someone just going off on how she just flung this novel down, refused to finish it when she got to the lesbian scene. And I thought, oh, well, I guess I'm not every audience for this. I'm not a representative audience member for this. So maybe um, there's a way in which uh, with uh, a certain member of the paying public in mind, uh, Gonzalez is also trying to uh, push the envelope and be outrageous um, to, in other words, uh, get into the queerer dimensions of these stories um, at, at, on multiple fronts. So yeah, Bonobos. Uh, and Bonobos in fiction more broadly, I would love to hear more people's thoughts on too, um, because I agree with you. I'm seeing them more and more as well. Sorry, I was trying to press the space bar and I've now entered 15 spaces in the chat. Uh, Mariana, you can, uh, <laughs> you're up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan, for this talk. It was really uh, fascinating. So I was uh, particularly struck by, because you're talking about casino pregnancy, right? And, um, and the zoo and this picture, the, the iconic image of the, of the fetus um, by, I guess it's a Swedish photographer, Nielsen. And uh, it's something that is, and you also read uh, Wisława Szymborska's poem now in the beginning. And it seems to be like a super pertinent thing on my mind right now with the current 
um, struggles in Poland about abortion and how the anti-choice movement is using those images uh, um, for their cause and not really knowing also the history of how those images are created and etc. But I was wondering particularly, and there's an overpresence of kind of fetal imagery right now on my uh, newsfeed with what's going on in my country and all of that uh, from both sides. Uh, and I was wondering about the um, non-human aspects of human fetus, feti, of like how this idea um, that um, in, in fetal development that somehow there was the scientific idea that that uh, ontogeny replicates phylogen uh, phylogeny uh, and that like uh, some of the stages of the development show that kind of like the human fetus looks more like a fish and it looks more like uh, an amphibian and etc it has a tail and I wonder if that uh, is touched upon in any of the novels or also do you uh, think about that because all the examples are with primates and but you do talk a little bit about um, the Przewalski horses and, and other species but I wonder if there's some kind of or any other literary uh, text that would actually talk about non-primate uh, non-human fetal developments or whatnot just yeah sharing the thought thank you so much Thank you, Mariana. Great question. And um, these are the only three that I have found so far. So that's partly what motivated me to return to um, to, to try my hand at writing about zoo fictions um, was that these I've just been trying to figure out what to make of the three of them together. Uh, I've taught them all. Um, and uh, so I, I recognize that readers respond strongly to them and in different ways. Um, but it, it is an important detail, especially in this broader political context that you're calling uh, everyone's attention to for such good reasons. And thank you for doing that. Um, it's an important detail that these, uh, uh, the fetus itself, unlike the text that Lauren Berlant is writing about, doesn't enter in as a character. Um, it's not given a voice. It's not um, even really described or visualized. It's just, um, um, primarily focused on the mother, uh, on the pregnant body, which um, now that you're making me think about it is really the more utopian dimension of it, the, the power that women, uh, women's bodies um, can have. Not all women, of course, um, as it shouldn't be, um, and not all, uh, and not evenly either, um, as just, uh, you know, you're Polish, I'm in the US, <laughs> This is a huge problem for us right now in the political moment too. So um, I'm with you that uh, the overemphasis perhaps on uh, the fetal um, story uh, in the absence of and somehow miraculously in these people's minds separated from the story of the pregnant body that it wouldn't exist without um, seems, yeah. I have my problem with that, let's say. Um, but it's also, uh, yeah, so these stories really come in from a very different angle um, and a very different angle than the sort of thing that the Leonard Nielsen photos um, from the 1960s and 70s really aren't um, uh, capable of doing. But uh, that said, the Leonard Nielsen um, images, uh, it's quite conveniently forgotten about those images by people who use them for these uh, uh, anti-abortion purposes, um, that his source was aborted fetal matter. Um, he had to do it that way, he said, in order to make the most of getting the lighting and playing around with the different um, uh, photographic techniques to help to visualize it in more detail. Um, it seems pretty nuts that these images themselves are now <laughs> repurposed by the same people. And even on that Life magazine cover, um, it says that it's in utero, um, but it's not. And that I think is a really, um, it, it signals how the fetus as uh, a figure um, builds in a lot of contradictions um, and that uh, I really appreciate Berlant's theoretical work um, in this wonderful essay, America Fat the Fetus, that she um, brings the role of motherhood and the cheapening of motherhood 
into the story too, um, or calls our attention to how that's a key component of the using the fetus um, in that way. But yeah, I'm not sure, not having been someone who spent a lot of time thinking about uh, fetal imaging and fetal stories, I don't really um, know what uh, to say about what the conversation has been recently. And I don't know if it's just my own laziness as a scholar that I'm relying on Haraway's and Berlant's and others writing in the 1990s, but I just and looking and trying to prepare this talk, didn't find much in current discussion about this. And so I wonder, um, because those discussions in the 90s seem to be about um, the rise and the popularization of assisted reproductive technologies. And I'm wondering if two decades later, um, now that it's so normalized in industrial cultures um, and uh, the surrogacy now has been legislated away uh, from exploiting poor women in a lot of the world, but unfortunately not all of the world, um, that that seems uh, to be another dimension um, to the discussion. So if there are things that I'm not aware of, please call my attention to it because I would really appreciate that. Yeah, if I may quickly follow up, uh, your last sentence made me think also of how, um, of course, the, the imag Im imagining technologies definitely changed, but also all these um, processes uh, of assisted reproduction are often uh, very much depending on animal labor if we think about research on hormones and hormone extraction and etc so that's one thing and but the other thing is also um, if you, anyone could imagine a story written about a non-primate xeno pregnancy you know because there is a huge literature on xeno transplantation with um, pigs and swine species but would that be already too grotesque to, or it's a totally different story, right? I don't know if, uh, I, I don't remember what are pigoons exactly in Margaret Atwood, maybe that's just a throw, but like how come uh, it never leaves the primate taxon, is it? Or, yeah. I think pigoons are part human. I think that's what the uncanniness of them is. And if I'm remembering correctly, it's been a while since I've read those novels, um, but I think that's what makes them particularly fearsome. And that's why they're in that very uh, biosecure facility in the beginning, because the uh, potential for, as is the case of these um, uh, macaque, um, the genetically modified macaques, and um, that, yeah, they cannot leave these facilities for fear of exactly what we're experiencing now, <laughs> zoonotic pandemics. Uh, breaking out, but yeah, I don't know. I, I'm curious to hear, it, it was funny to me to have to take that turn into real life xeno pregnancies outside um, uh, hominids, outside primates, um, and that they're there, um, and that they're not hidden there, they're made public by the zoo there, um, in the case of um, Manhar, EQ, and now Kurt and others too. But yeah, the fact that we um, are doing these same techniques, um, but the primates are being held in laboratories instead seems pretty significant. So I guess uh, Octavia Butler would be an example of a non-primate uh, xeno pregnancy. All right, well, I don't know, the, the human in that case would be the primate. Uh, but yes, Gabriel Schwab has written about that, and that's in that same kind of collection, Playing Dolly, where Confessions of a Bioterrorist was published as well. She compares the two stories along those lines. So yeah, I would agree with that, Kari. Uh, so there's a couple, well, there's a whole lively discussion going on uh, in the in the chat between, I don't know, Sarah and Islam, do you want to take this public or are you uh, happy just to continue in, behind the scene? Well, please take it public. <laughs> I'm not paying attention to the chat right now. I'm trying to focus. So I'm missing out otherwise. Sarah, you go first. All right, never mind then. Uh, well, Concepcion has a. Uh, I see, it's too yes. loud. Concepcion has uh, a question in the meantime. Yeah, 
Uh, well, thank you very much, Susan. A lot to think about, and it's also very interesting how these patterns keep repeating in different ways and in, in, in these novels, in this case. And I also wanted to offer a bit of information in case it's uh, useful, and is that there is another book uh, um, uh, written and published in the 70s, which is also called Lucy. Uh, uh, well, in, in specifically, uh, Lucy growing up human, a chimpanzee daughter in a psychotherapist therapist family. I will, I put, I will put in, in the chat uh, for everyone to see. And it's, not, it's a nonfiction book. And it's, um, it's very uh, sexually charged. And, uh, uh, and the chimpanzee Lucy the, is uh, a signing uh, ape. So she's able to communicate through sign. And I was remembering uh, this book, uh, which I read, uh, well, some time ago, because the, the father, the one that, the author of the book, uh, at some point fantasizes about uh, incest with his chimpanzee daughter in order to pioneer something. So it seems like <laughs> it has a lot to do with what is portrayed in those novels. But in this case, it seems like in the, the reverse, maybe, because he, yeah, he's like, and it's a little bit disturbing about him like being annoyed that uh, his chimpanzee daughter won't think about his, uh, him in a sexual ways. So it's, yeah, it's really, really, well, I think it's related to what we were discussing. And at some point there's also quotes uh, by Jane Goodall, uh, uh, related to sex and how she's asked constantly about sex and chimpanzees. And well, I thought that you would find that uh, interesting. Thank you. I wasn't aware of that at all. And that sounds absolutely perfect. Um, you're reminding me too, and, and in the novel Lucy, it's referenced as well that there were real life uh, experiments in, uh, on, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, these were Europeans and US people, I think, setting up these research stations that were trying to hybridize humans and chimpanzees. And this is uh, theoretically the um, one of the origin stories of uh, how HIV uh, jumped the species boundary, uh, simian AIDS mutate into human AIDS. Um, but uh, I don't really know what to do with those materials. and. and Having to steal myself to dig that up and, and teach myself that history um, is going to be part of the project. It's just something that I lazily and shamelessly bracketed off for now. But that sounds like the perfect reason to go back to. Well, I, I think it, it's part of a context in where they were like exploring all this kind of all new age kind of things and connection with nature in strange ways and trying to liberate themselves in sexual ways that now we find strange, but yeah, I thought it was related to what you were discussing. So. Thank you, that just sounds like so wonderful and I would really appreciate you sharing that. Well, I, I have put that on the chat, so the title is there okay. and the name of the author, so. Thank you. So, um, Roslyn, do you, in fact, want to say something about the fish? Sorry, was that me? Roslyn, you are muted. We can't hear you. Okay. So, um, I mean, the question was directed to um, Susan, that's why uh, you know I, I, I hesitated. Uh, I just put my ideas there uh, in response to Sarah. Uh, but yeah, perhaps Susan would like to answer the question if she's uh, if she remembers uh, or you know if she's um, if, if she's familiar with the novel. Um, because Susan's que uh, excuse me, Sarah's question is directed to Susan. 
uh, I just made some additions. Maybe uh, Susan can read both and uh, respond to them. Uh, but, you know, I find it interesting, maybe uh, more than anything else in this context, because some people um, also wrote on uh, labor, the issue of labor, animal labor, for example. And in this particular novel, Saltfish Girl, uh, the issue of labor is also in the very uh, foreground, uh, because the clones are produced with the special purpose of uh, using them in factories. Uh, you know, uh, just ex ex exploiting their labor uh, and uh, also, you know, prohibiting their uh, interactions uh, or their, you know, basically prohibiting their uh, agency, although they have um, the power of agency. Uh, so it's uh, there are all kinds of issues coming together in this novel. I find it really fascinating and I'm, you know, uh, I would be curious to know also, you know, what Susan thinks about this novel, if she is familiar with it or if she remembers uh, from a previous reading or something. Uh, the first question was about heteronormative behavior. And again, you know, this issue is also very complex in Saltfish Girl. Uh, on one hand, yes, it, it almost starts with a very heteronormative uh, act of trying to get pregnant. Uh, but then, you know, the life of the protagonist uh, continues with a series, or, or both protagonists, I, we should say, because uh, there are alternating chapters, uh, continues with um, a lot of, um, you know, non-heteronormative uh, actions. Um, you know, just a few comments, a response to Sarah, which inspired me, <laughs> so. Thank you. You know, I hadn't been thinking of Saltfish Girl. I don't know why I hadn't been thinking, but that's what we're here to do, <laughs> to yeah. inspire, the inspire other. each other. Inspire each other. I was also very much inspired. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, that's a fantastic novel. I would say that, um, you know, as far as uh, deeply, deeply unsettling me as a reader and making me look at the world very differently, um, that novel, Larissa Lay's Saltfish Girl, if you guys haven't read it, is uh, put it on your lists, please, because it really is um, just, yeah, <laughs> there's so much to say there. But yeah, I guess I hadn't really been thinking about this in relation to this, because I was really fixated on the zoo thing, and I was really fixated on the fetal thing, that um, the whole larger issues of um, that, that are raised within that novel um, weren't really, uh, the connections weren't that obvious, but now that you mention them, I see it. And um, yeah, I'm just thinking on my feet right now. So probably could at best give you a half baked response to a really good question. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's let's talk more in future yeah, about this. I, want more to about it, yes. it before, uh, I do of seeds, for example, in the fruit, instead of a fetus, we have a fruit. Uh, that uh, induces pregnancy and uh, then this whole image of the fruit and the smell uh, and uh, all of it, uh, you know, all, all these are really worth discussing, actually. They have relevance to your subject, which is also very fascinating. Thank you. Well, the plant dimension there is just worth mentioning. Um, part of uh, why I got away from this project was because um, it, my second book, idea initially had been to, or my third book, uh, yeah. <laughs> After Animal Stories, I was then gonna go deeper into these technoscience stories, or at least I thought I was, because in circa 2000, it felt like um, what we needed were more direct responses to all of this cloning, transgenic um, technologies and how they were being represented in media. And it was really obvious to me at the time, I really only wrote, uh, the animal side and the plant side in sort of two companion essays. Um, one focusing on how um, transgenics in animal form, the case I looked at was uh, the most recent um, Island of Dr. Moreau, transgenics in animal form are everywhere. You can see them because they're big movie monsters. They just work so well um, to uh, within pre-existing narratives of monstrosity. Um, and somehow animal form makes sense culturally, logically. Um, and the inverse is the 
transgenic plants, which are almost nowhere. And I found this one novel at the time, Ruth Ozeki's All Over Creation, that is about transgenic potatoes. Um, but that was there was a dearth of these kinds of narratives at the time. And what was so funky to me was that in real life, we're never going to meet these uh, uh, gene edited cloned monkeys, even though they exist. Ordinary people are never going to come in contact with them. Whereas if you eat a banana in the US or wear cotton or, you know, every major crop, it seems, is transgenic unless it's carefully labeled otherwise. Um, and most cases, not very carefully labeled. So it could be. Um, the fact that transgenic plants are omnipresent in our lives and missing from literature, except Oh, fish girls thank you for that we will definitely go back to it thanks since um there's a question uh well since you, you were just talking about form um and i've been asked to ask you uh about uh about the question of form and you also mentioned uh in your in your talk um the ideas of you know genres of being human and genres of feminism and uh, and genres in general and I um, I wonder if you could say something about um, well the aesthetic formal dimensions of this question also especially you know if the content is about you know um, I don't know splicing genres uh, going across uh, across these lines. You know, to what extent are the are the are the texts formally or aesthetically innovative, or different, or post-humanist in in the way they tell the story rather than just what it's about? That's a really good question that I haven't given much thought to. But um, I guess it was funny to think that I was resisting in my own mind announcing them to you or presenting them to you as science fiction, because they don't read like um, the old genre, science fiction. Speculative fictions, probably they fit into that. But what's kind of remarkable, in, and again, why I was resisting doing that until now here we're talking about it, um, is that they really do fall back on fairly straightforward, realistic presentations of their characters. And I think they have to do that at a certain level in order to get us to believe in them in the first place. So um, yeah, there's, uh, I think, a very conscious set of decisions made on the part of these authors. And not, interestingly, Larissa Lay, um, in my memory of Saltfish Girl, there are some really like psychedelic, dreamy sequences that are hard to follow and seem to be really experimental in their approaches to writing. Um, that said, uh, with the cases of Confessions of a Bioterrorist and The Woman of the Ape, fictions that have prefaces that change your ways of reading it, I don't know if they're, they're I don't know, if, I can't think of any other examples right now, but that might be an emergent genre unto itself. Um, the fiction that has to have a framing or that due to its framing guides you to pay attention to certain aspects of it. Um, yeah. I. I wonder if there's anybody <laughs> researching this because I would like to read more about uh, how this happens across time or whether this is a contemporary phenomenon. I doubt that it is, um, but I would imagine also that it's a fairly minor um, tradition, literary tradition, minor in the good villas Guattarian sense, uh, degrading okay. density. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was—I mean, I was thinking of more of the Derrida and the law of genre, right? You must not mix genres and uh, and so on. And these te texts seem to be mixing genres, but not actually mixing genres. If you see what I mean. Um, anyway, I think uh, I think that would be uh, would be a, a question worth pursuing. You know, what are what are the genres of the post-human? I want you to write that essay. <laughs> okay, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> and then I'll cite it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, okay. So you're outsourcing this uh, now, is that, is that the story? Um, okay, well, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, if there are any more um, questions or comments or... Perhaps to respond to your last question uh, about form and what mm -hmm. kind of fiction are we reading here and everything. I recently come uh, across a concept called weird fiction, 
Yeah. Although I haven't uh, investigated uh, that, you know, I didn't have the time, uh, you know, so far I haven't had the time, uh, but I was interested. Uh, so I'm curious to know, you know, if uh, anybody in the audience uh, knows uh, more about this genre called weird fiction, uh, whether or not, you know, we're, it's something totally different from what we're talking about here. I just wanted to ask you guys. Well, I, mean, I, I mean, Jeff Vandermeer and the, uh, and the Area X uh, trilogy is also all about mixing genres, I guess. Um, but I'm not sure how, uh, how formally innovative it is. Pau, do you have a, uh, something to add here? Well, it was also, well, also Jeff Vandermeer, he also wrote a book called, called Born, Born A, sort of, and that, but that doesn't necessarily also deal with uh, xenomorphic birth, but it does deal sort of with, it does sort of mix different genres, but not necessarily in form, more in sort of the, the, the thematic devices it brings in, I suppose, and there's sort of more a mixture of, I don't know, from fantasy to, to magic realism to, to, to sort of steampunk. But it's, I wouldn't say it's, it's innovative in form, in that sense. Um, we do also have uh, Sheena Mjevil, who's also a, the, an important writer in the in the new weird fiction. Um, but um, and he also has sort of all these weird sort of constructs and and sort of hybrids between humans and animals, sort of humans with the head of an insect and sort of parasites that live inside someone and are also birthed in a sense. But it's, but there it's also sort of more a mixture of, of thematic genres than it's really sort of the, in the form of the text itself, like the, the way it sort of presents its its characters. So, yeah, but it's, but it's it's definitely an interesting genre to talk about post-human literature. So. Susan, do you have anything to add? Um, it's definitely an area that I am not well read in, um, and yet I feel behind in because um, my students keep thrusting weird fictions at me. And I think the answers that they give me to, so what makes it weird, haven't been very consistent so far. Um, and I really haven't been tuned into the scholarly discussions of it. So much of it has been dominated by Lovecraft and now the uh, you know, just uh, discussions of his racism and, you know, the problems of uh, authorship in general. Um, but yeah, definitely it seems like a new and emergent um, thematic area, I would say too. Although, yeah, I, I leave it to other people like Powell who've uh, clearly read a lot more within the genre than I have. And um, so I can't really say with any authority <laughs> um, whether these particular stories that I'm writing about would fit in that way. Although now that you mentioned it, my friend who's deeply disturbed by the woman and the ape um, is a big fan of weird fiction. So that might be an indication, at least at, at that level, that um, it fits in what they would perceive as a weird story. Or perhaps what you're reading is even weirder. Um, <laughs> and that's why it's so disturbing. You. <laughs> I take that as a compliment. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> so yeah. Lynn, Lynn has a uh, has a has a recommendation. Lynn, do you want to give it uh, to us uh, verbally? Damn the unmute button. Um, no, I just on on the on the subject of the weird. Um, and, and to have something that was a little bit more affirmative and interesting um, and feminist. Um, I, I mean, I just a massive shout out to Jeff Ryman, who I think is an astonishing writer uh, and he's amazing. Um, actually kind of viral, so a little bit thematic right now. Viral novel, The Child Garden. Um, I mean, there, there's lots of different kind of transgenic kind of mutations in, in, a, in a near future in which um, um, we have to photosynthesize for food, for food. Um, and cancer has been banned from the world, has been erased from the world, but, but must come back, disease must come back in order for us to actually live 
I mean, it's it's really really good. Uh, and thank you. I'm, I think we've maybe maybe tracked off Susan some rich talk, which I think we're all just like percolating around and and probably deeply troubled by also. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> Job done. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> I think that's 90% of what I do uh, in retrospect is get deeply disturbed by things and then share that with others. Um, I don't know why I think that's being a good academic, but there you have it. <laughs> mm. At least we're together, at least we're processing it together now. It's pretty hard to be alone in a dark corner with some of these materials. Um, I think I'm speaking not just about these particular stories, but um, when you do uh, cultural work with animals, um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it can take you quickly to some harsh spots. So that's all the more reason why I'm so grateful to folks like Kari for holding these spaces for us to come together to have different experiences, different opinions, different takes to share with each other and not feel like we're just uh, the only ones who are aware of the problems and who are uh, engaging with them. This is part of a wider project, Susan. This? With this, this question, the, you know, um, pregnancy kind of question. It's, uh, it's dragging me back into that project that I dodged and <laughs> wrote Love on a Time of Slaughters instead. So it's possible. Um, I'm, for some reason, being dragged in a bunch of different directions right now, a bunch of different impulses, but I'm trying to figure it out. And uh, this seems like it makes a lot of sense to me, or at least putting this together for you guys. Um, some pieces started falling back into place in my head that made it seem like um, it would be a good way to go. And, and with the excuse of rereading um, Saltfish Girl and with reading, tracking down and reading The Child Garden and getting into other things, I can easily be drawn into making this a larger project. Um, but I'm not the type of person who can um, think ahead to what a project is. I just build it from the ground up and then discover somewhere along the way that, oh, this is actually a book. <laughs> this has just been my experience. I envy those of you who like have the project description, get the funding, get the thing done exactly the way or mostly the way that you had the vision of it in the first place, because I'm not a visionary type, I guess. <laughs> who are these people you're talking about? Sort of mucks it out with stuff and then, oh, uh, there it is, so. <laughs> um. Jessica posted something in the in the chat. I have a feel feeling that that uh, we're slowly running out of steam. We're also about five minutes uh, out. I don't know, Jessica, if you want to leave it at that, or if you want to say. Um, well, actually, it's not related to Susan's talk, and it's not related to literature, but it, it's just related to the topic of xeno pregnancies, and that's just like a topic that is. Um, that I'm observing in contemporary art right now. And I just gave like three examples, if you want to look at them, um, if that's at all interesting for you and your research. But um, yeah, for me and, and my students, it's uh, usually very disturbing um, to talk about, you know, um, human women giving birth to apes or dogs or whatever. But um, you can also read that in like the context of interspecies care, for example or making kin. I'm trying to do that and see it in a positive way sometimes. Oh, wow, Jessica, you and I need to talk more. This is a good excuse for me to reach out to you. So don't let me not do that. <laughs> that sounds really cool. I wasn't aware at all of uh, where this shows up in contemporary art or any art. So I would really love to learn more from that, uh, from you about that. Yeah, sure. So just to think about why that's happening now too, because mm -hmm. I'm guessing your examples are contemporary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So very recent, last <laughs> ten years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Aslam. Um, I find it very interesting, you know, Jessica's comment, especially this title, "Closing the Gap." Uh, you know, thinking back to again colonial discourse, um, "closing the gap" is such a significant uh, statement uh, and sentence. Uh, so. It's a typical white uh, colonialist uh, statement, uh, you know, of closing the gap between 
the colonizer and the indigenous. And uh, I'm, I wonder if this is an ironic uh, touch on it, uh, closing the gap. You know, it's, it's, it sounds so ironic to me and so meaningful. Uh, I really would like to find out more about the significance of this title. You know, of course, you can't really decide uh, whether it's ironic or maybe is it again falling back to the colonial discourse? Um, so could you comment on that? Yeah, I don't know much about the title. Well, I know the artist and most of his artworks are very ironic. He's uh, usually designing um, post-evolutionary uh, beings, creatures like new um, kinds of plants or animal hybrids. And um, this work about a human ape hybrids is um, probably, I, no, I don't know what, I don't know. I don't know, it is probably f meant to be funny kind of, but also um, I, th I don't think that he's very familiar with the post-colonial, colonial, um, implications of the title. I don't know though. Uh, I could ask him if, if you're really interested. I can also post his website maybe and you can just look at the work. I um, appreciate it, yes. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's like a poster, it's like an advertising where he's looking yeah. for and also questionnaires where he's looking for um, human women who are willing to you know get impregnated with uh, ape sperm or the other way around and you can fill out the questionnaire and send it to him and then it's all it's of course it's all funny and ironic um I'm sure it's very ironic you know it's it probably doesn't subscribe to that you know uh colonialist uh, state. I don't think so. Sure it's it's not because, you know, yeah. uh, imagining, even imagining uh, this kind of uh, a kinship, let's say, between human yeah. and non-human is yeah. contrary to the spirit of the old discourse anyway. Yeah. Uh, this is our, but I very much appreciate it if you could write yeah. me. Yeah, I just look for it and, and post it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, I hear the bell tolling uh, seven o'clock. So um, we should wrap this up and thank Susan once again for this simulating talk. And I think Susan, uh, based on this, you have no excuse. This is the this is going to be the next book, uh, <laughs> whether you like it or not. It has implanted itself now in your uh, oeuvre. Um, towards Bethlehem to be born. That's right. That's a, you. You got the you got the answer to what rough beast it was. Um, okay. Well, uh, thank you so much. Um, I hope many of you will be able to join us tomorrow night uh, for Juno's um, keynote, second keynote, uh, part of the the workshop. Those of you who are part of the workshop, I'll see you tomorrow at noon. Um, Thank you uh, all for the first day. I think this was uh, really productive. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, Thank you everyone for your wonderful questions and for giving your time to listen to me uh, talk about some weird stuff. Thank you so much for giving me so much to think about too. And round of applause for Kari. <laughs> and, and for you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. And I'm just looking at the chat and realizing there's a billion things in here. <laughs> yeah, I've I just uh, I just saved it. Uh, you oh, can do. Good. It. Thank you. I was just about to ask you for that, so um, thank you so much. That you can do. It. I mean, if you want a copy as well, you can do it at the. At the there's a, like a three oh, dots. Oh, the file button. At the bottom. Next, next to the file button, there's the there's the three dots, and there you can save the chat. Okay, I didn't realize you could do that without being the host. That's awesome. Oh, maybe you can't do that. Uh, oh, okay. it, says, it says chat saved, show in folder. So I got to go look for it. Ah, yeah, I got it.
great. Awesome. Oh, okay. okay. See you tomorrow. Thanks so much. See you tomorrow. Thank you.